Welcome to Intangibles Podcast. I'm Steve Berg, your host. Success is driven by how as much as by what. How we communicate, how we lead, how we relate to our environment are all vitally important. Intangibles is a podcast that explores the underlying traits, qualities, and behaviors that improve the how. This is accomplished by finding the people who have studied and been successful practicing these soft skills and having informed conversations with them to get to what is learnable. Let's begin. The impediment to action becomes the action. What stands in the way becomes the way. One would think this must be wisdom imparted to startup founders during the keynote of TechCrunch Disrupt or something like it. In fact, Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius wrote these words around 173 AD. Ryan Holiday is 32 years old and by now has written 10 books. I don't think one should throw around the term whiz kid too liberally. And I also don't think I'm going out on a limb in saying that there are a number of people, including world-class athletes, TV personalities, and political leaders that have considered him as such. The last decade or so has been pretty interesting for Ryan. These days, when he's not writing, he's either tending to farm animals out on his ranch in Austin or consulting via the creative agency he founded called Brass Check. When he is writing, the books he's authored include The Obstacle is the Way, which is my personal favorite, Ego is the Enemy, The Daily Stoic, Conspiracy, and his newest, Stillness is the Key. There's a bunch more to know about Ryan, including why he dropped out of college, what he covers in his widely read blog, and that he's also written a myriad of articles for prestigious publications. But I'll leave that to you, the listeners, to research. During our discussion today, I'm going to be spending a little time on Stillness is the Key and a little time on The Obstacle is the Way, because I think they fit together nicely. Incidentally, the quote that I started this episode with is on the inside cover of the latter book. Without further ado, welcome, Ryan. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on. Of course. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat. So let's dive right in. As I look at your book, Stillness is the Key and Obstacle is the Way in Concert, I think the message is to first prepare yourself mentally and physically, and second, to look at the challenges in the proper way approach the challenges with a plan, and execute that plan for as long as it takes. Do I have that message correct? Yeah, I, I think that's right. Uh, I think ultimately a, a good chunk of philosophy is about sort of getting your mindset right as a way of sort of dissembling a lot of the problems that we face in life. So sort of how you think about it is ultimately going to determine what you're going to be able to do about it, whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, I mean, let's break that down into its pieces then. So stillness is the key. Uh, the new book focuses on the first part, which is the preparation. Uh, I see the book as a step-by-step guide on how to kind of build an inner citadel and how to pre- prepare yourself for moments when you have to confront challenges or obstacles. Um, why don't we start by explaining kind of conceptually what stillness um, and the word that I'm about to butcher, uh, aquaminitas, is and and why it really is the key to doing what you want. So so stillness is that kind of even keel, uh, that 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 ability to not be rocked too hard, uh, too high or too low by the things that are happening around you. The the other uh, stoic concept that's sort of related to stillness. There's two. There's this word ataraxia, and the other is apatheia. And it basically it means like what what's left. When you're not jerked by external or internal passions, so when you're not, you know, uh, when when the the out when outside news can't upset you, and when you're not upset by you know in, internal things like memories or fears or worries, how can you get to a place where where you're just chill? That that doesn't mean you're not doing anything. It's actually how do you get to a place where You've got this sort of like, okay, we'll deal with this attitude towards anything and everything that happens. Right. Not that there's no flow, just that you kind of know that there's going to be a flow and you're comfortable with that environment. That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And when you really think about the people you admire, the people who, who do great things, I think what they're defined by is this inability, this, this ability to not be rattled 
by anything. You know, you could tell them the sky is falling. You could tell them they just lost a million dollars. You could tell them, you know, they've just been indicted, you know, whatever it is. And, and they, they're, they're like, okay, well here, let's get to work, you know, let's get to work on this thing. And, and I think that's obviously the attitude that I'm talking about in, um, in the obstacles the way this idea of sort of calming your nerves and managing your emotions. But, but it's, it, it, it's like, how do you have that sort of that through line, uh, in all the things that you do in life? It's so funny. I mean, I, your examples that you brought up are great and I'm not going to dwell on it too long, but when I was reading, um, stillness, I thought about um, snowboarding and there's a moment you're either on your front edge or your back edge of your snowboard, but there's a moment when you're not on either edge um, and you're not entirely in control at that moment, right? Because you're just gliding, you're just floating. And, you know, you feel at the beginning when you're a novice, you feel a little out of control in that moment between your front edge and your back edge. But over time you get comfortable knowing that that, kind of lack of control is okay. Nothing bad is going to happen to you during that moment until you finally get back onto the other edge and you feel in control. And so the examples that you gave kind of like line up with my mental picture of what that is. And so I'm glad. Um, All right. So stillness, uh, the book focuses on mind, spirit, and body um, in order to have the kind of proper perception. Um, I think what, you know, one should start with a prepared mind. So let's discuss how we cultivate our minds, right? Why don't you, I don't want to give away the whole book. Um, so, sure. so, so we, don't, and also the other thing is we'll probably end up talking for hours if I, if, if we were to just dig deep on it, why don't we go with a high level, um, and of, you know, um, this notion of spirit, um, and, and, yeah. and then maybe we can dig in on one or two. Well, so the reason I split the book up that way, and I think it's important, is that, you know, oftentimes I think when people hear something like, a, a, hear a concept like stillness, um, they, or, or they, they think sort of it's it's just mental stillness, right? They think, oh, you know, you sit and you meditate, and that's how you get there or whatever. It's much more complicated than that. And in fact, like, if you really think about it, there are people who, like, telling them to sit alone with their thoughts is, like, the worst possible advice you could get them, because you could give them because their life is such a mess. Right. Um, and, and so what I'm really saying is that to get to that place where you're, where you're so strong and so firm and so even keeled that you can't be rocked by external events, you really need to, you really need to attack it from different angles. So part of it is, yeah. How how do you think, you know, what sort of thought patterns you have running in your head? Um, what practices you do to get in the right head space? But then also spiritually, right? Like um, if you are, uh, you know, still still stewing over childhood issues, if you are, you know, at the mercy of your temper or your desires all the time, any of that mental stillness you get is going to be short lived. And then, you know, the final domain is like, what does your actual life look like? So you might have a great meditation practice, but if your house is overfilling with crap you don't need or your lifestyle is way beyond your, you know, your ability to, to afford it. Or if you have really bad habits, whether it's diet or sleep or, you know, routine, again, all of these things are going to add up in a way that it's just like impossible for you to have any real lasting or enduring stillness. Right, right. Okay. So the first one, I, I, I said spirit, I, I misspoke. The first one is, is, um, yeah. cultivate your mind, right? And there's a number of particular things that you point out. I don't know if you have any particular favorites. If you don't, I'll give you some of mine. But maybe we could talk a little bit about the the mind cultivation portion. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, I found one of the best ways that I start my day off, right, that, that, that gets my thinking in the right place, is I sit down with a journal each morning. And, and I want to take Instead of being at the mercy of my thoughts, I want to put my thoughts down on the page so I can so I can look at them, right? So I can see them with a little bit of a distance. Um, and so, it, you know, the act of of sitting down and and realizing, look, you're not your thoughts. We we have these thoughts that pop into our, in and out of our heads all the time, and we have the ability to decide which ones we're going to stick with and which ones we're going to let sort of pass by like clouds. And so, I think this practice of of, of really analyzing your thoughts and, and, and sort of looking at them critically is a huge part of getting so, so many of the things that I'm worried about when I put them up to the test, you know, when I really break them down, 
I realize that they're totally absurd and I don't even, not only do I not need to be worried about them, really don't even need to be thinking about them at all. Um, so that, I mean, your example is perfect, right? There was a, you actually used the phrase in the book that I, I loved and I wrote down about allowing the wild horses to run right by. Um, yes. So, so in the notion of meditation, you're, you're, you're touching a whole bunch of things, right? That is where you're most present. That is where your mm -hmm. mind is the clearest. And I also imagine, depending on where you meditate, although I, you know, I know some people do it on the subway on the way into work, um, that is probably where you most frequently um, cultivate silence. Yes, yes. And I think silence is a big one, right? People do not have enough silence in their life. You know, look, we're, we're talking on a podcast, so clearly uh, you're bullish on podcasts and I'm bullish on podcasts. But it's interesting to me that we've now taken – uh, this tech that we have to be like cramming noise into our ears every second, right? And then we wonder why we don't have time to really, really think about things or, or really figure out what we think about things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, just as an aside on that, I um, know that that is a uh, kind of a flaw of mine. So I kind of book about an hour on my, I literally put it on my calendar for Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays to, to like actually do some thinking. Um, which is wow, not exactly, that's great. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly mind, uh, uh, mindfulness in that way, but it, it kind of gets around the problem of noise. Like, so for me this, this morning I went swimming and, and it was really important that I one um, that, that I didn't like sort of get caught up in email before I went into the pool. And then, you know, that, so this 40 minutes where I, you know, not only is it is it quiet because I'm not listening to music or anything, but there's kind of a sensory deprivation thing going on, and I really find that I do some of my best thinking there in the pool um, because I've I've basically turned down the volume on everything else. Yeah, I've um, I've done sensory deprivation tanks a couple of times as well, and even the preparation for going there, like oh, I'm gonna have time. What am I gonna think about? Like even that preparation yeah. has value to me. Um, all right. I think, so, I think that's right. So, all right. So we've got that. That's mind. The next piece of the book is spirit. Um, so, you know, spirit, I'm going to let you define it uh, for yourself before we dig into it a little bit. Spirit refers to what? Yeah. So spirit refers to this, the sort of soul, Let, let's call it like basically anything that's not mental or physical. Right. So, uh, I'm talking about the, the emotions that we feel, the kind of drives and urges that we have, um, the sort of moral sense that we bring to the to 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 our lives. You've got to get this. It, this is, I think, actually in some ways more important than the than the mental side of things. You look at uh, one of the characters I use in the section of the book is Tiger Woods. Here you have a great example of someone who physically complete master of himself. Me uh, mentally complete master of himself. That's why he was the greatest golfer in the world. But where his problem was, was this kind of spiritual emptiness or a spiritual, you know, recklessness or bankruptcy that eventually made it like impossible for him to keep these two spheres of his life separate. And then they came, you know, uh, eventually one destroyed the other. Yeah. When I, I mean, when I read the section of the book, I kept coming back to this idea of balance. Uh, I'm not sure if you see it similarly, um, but I think if we if we start when we start to dig in, um, you know, the at least if either we're on the same page or the differences will be kind of come clear, and maybe you'll you know be able to teach me something more than what I picked up when I was reading it. Um, so we, when we think about spirit, there's a number of elements that you talked about. Um, Again, I have my own favorites, but I, I imagine you do as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the the big one for me that I'm working on constantly in my own life is like my temper, right? So h how do we have – how do we get to a place where – look, just because we, we know what we think we should do doesn't mean that we're going to be able to do it in the moment, especially when people are provoking us or upsetting us. Like we live in times of, of sort of a perpetual outrage and, and a lot of time and money and energy goes into making sure we're upset because these are the emotions that drive us to talk about things on Twitter or share them on Facebook or, you know, uh, donate money to this group or that group. And so I, I think, again, if the idea is like, how do you get an even keel? You have to develop uh, a better fuel to run on than anger. I think about this in my own career. You know, you don't want to be driven by 
proving people wrong or shoving it in their faces. This is this might be in the short term, you know, sort of uh, explosive fuel, but that's really the problem that it's explosive and it can blow up all over you, right? And then and then you know the other part is like what happens when you actually get what you want when you do prove them wrong? It turns out oh actually nobody cared, you know? Yeah. I mean, in my own experience, when I have tried to use anger as fuel, I've, it has ended up becoming limiting um, and even a little counterproductive. Um, I would think in, in – yeah. yeah, right. I mean, you know, it does – and again, once that's taken away, then what, right? I mean, you should – there should be something – there should be better fuel than that to run on. What I found is that it's very corrosive fuel. Yeah. So it, it might do the job, but it eats at the vessel that's containing it, which is us, right? So like, you you know, this, this person is sort of working on this project for 10 years to shove it in the face of the business partner who, you know, who screwed them over. It's like, you think you're winning, but like the other person's not thinking about you at all. Meanwhile, like you're this sort of, uh, you know, constant state of turmoil and anger and pain. And, and that's just not, that's not winning. Even if you get what you want, you know, you, you, you were unhappy for so long. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about that as like, all right, so if, if you remove this kind of dissatisfaction, um, which, you know, I, I, which I think is uh, an underpinning of anger, what you, what you're, what you're left with should be contentment. And if you're content, that's right. Then ultimately contentment is, you know, I'm going to, because I'm building the case, I'm going to say, you know, contentment equals balance. Well, what I what I'm trying to work on in my life is can I succeed from a place that is not craving, right? Mm-hmm. Like, can I can I can I can I write the next book? Can I go on the media tour? Can I you know make this investment or that investment because I'm coming at it from a place of love or a place of uh, you know fascination or you know a place of fullness? Not from a place of like, uh, I, I must have this. I, if I don't have this, uh, blah, 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 blah. I want to, I want to come from a place of stillness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a, another, I mean, I, I know I'm cherry picking totally the best parts. I loved the example that you gave about, um, there's two writers having a discussion and they're talking about a, a billionaire and one of the two writers says to the other, he's like, well, I've got something that this guy will never have. And, you know, the, the other guy responds, well, what could that possibly be? And he says, well, you know, I, I know when enough is. Yeah. And, and I, I tell that story not just because I think it's like sort of a clever, you know, interesting quip, but I wanted to really look at the career of the writer who said that. Yeah. You know, he wrote this. It, it, it was Joseph Heller who wrote Catch-22. And it is true that Joseph Heller didn't write anything better than Catch-22 after that. Although when a reporter said that, he, he joked like, look, who has written a book better than that? But but his, his point was uh, he didn't stop writing just because he felt full or he had enough. It's that he was able to do it from a better, more grateful, less, you know, unpleasant place. And I think that's what I'm trying to work towards in my career. And I, I think I think we we'd all like is like. It's, it's not that contentment equals complacency. It's that contentment equals an appreciation for the moment that you're in and the work that you're doing. You still want to get better. You still want to grow. You still want to do more, but you don't need it. You know, it's not coming from a place of insecurity. It's coming from a place of confidence. Yeah. Well, and let's face it, you know, what you're talking about is very hard, right? Because there's a paradox that's kind of intrinsic Super to this. Hard nobody achieves excellence without the desire to get better yet the des- you know, this thing desire this want that you're talking about that's at odds with balance and happiness right when you want you you're out of whack that's that's right that's right and and like when i think about my books like sure there was that desire to get better and that's what took me from one project to the next project and it's kept me moving forward at the same time, the actual work itself, the, the reason that the books have worked, the reason I'm proud of what I've published, that that I when I think back of where that came from, that came from the fact that I just really love doing it. You know, like I wasn't writing each morning because I was craving validation. I was writing each morning because I had something I wanted to say. 
Yeah. That, I mean, that, <laughs> that is the key, right? That, you know, not, yes. if you can, if you can live your whole life that way, you're going to be in good shape. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, moving forward, the third kind of major pillar is uh, body. Um, mm-hmm. What I take away from this section, and by the way, it's clear that the, that there's a reason this one actually becomes is, is the last of the three that you discuss. Um, what I take away from this section is that the challenges we face um, in both the obstacle of the, uh, in both the obstacle is the way, and in the striving for balance, um, it, it takes a, a boatload of fortitude. Um, and there actually, yes. there genuinely is a physical side to fortitude. Um, what That's would, right. yeah, what would you, what would you highlight as it relates to this part of the book, um, about things that you do on the body side? And, and, and frankly, the truth is, you know, it's not like a bunch of push ups that you're recommending. There's a bunch of other things. No. Um, what, what, yeah, what would you, what do you pick out? I think what, what I'm saying is you're not going to think you're not only going to think and feel your way into stillness. You also have to do things, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and again, it's not just sitting, but it is like, can you, like, look, uh, one of the best ways to get to stillness is like start saying no to stuff. We, we say yes to so many things, and then we wonder why we feel and think like we're overwhelmed. It's like, well, you know, you are overwhelmed. <laughs> you, you, uh, you said yes to too many things. So a, a big one I work on is just like, you know, deliberately deciding like, uh, what's important and what's not important. Uh, Greg McCowan wrote a great book a few years ago called essentialist, you know, the ability to, to discern between what's essential and what's not essential and actively choose the essential is a really key skill in, in sort of moving towards stillness. Um, but, but I, I mean, I think the, the biggest one that I'd highlight is just this idea of sort of ritual and routine. I think way too many people are just sort of winging it through life. And so when, when it's, when things are good, when things are chill, when everything's going your way, um, stillness isn't, it is it, kind of within your grasp, mm-hmm. but the problem is life, life is unpredictable. You know, um, you get, you get surprise choices and opportunities. And so if you can kind of winnow down your scope of focus uh, if you can create, if you can add some order to the chaos, you're going to feel better and, and, and you're going to feel like things are slowing down because in a way you've eliminated a lot of the other things that are, that are zipping around you. Yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Um, by the way, Greg and I will both send you the $5 later because, um, Greg has been on the podcast talking about essentialism. Um, and so you've, you've <laughs> yeah. just, you've just, uh, circled back a plug. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, this this notion of building routine, I think, is really, um, you know, people underestimate the value of routine. Um, you know, one, one thing they tell you about little kids is whatever you do, make sure they get enough sleep. And um, mm-hmm. so for my son, who's now 10, um, you know, I don't even know since when, since he was born, I'm sure, like at the exact same time every single night, that's when it's time for bed. So the first 15 minutes is a shower. The second 15 minutes is getting ready. The next half hour is reading. All of those things are essentially his runway. And I'm going to say it, it's yes. his glide path to performance. And what I mean by performance is that is the signal to him and his body that it is time to fall asleep. That is how you know, we get him into his zone. Now, granted, not, not everyone listening to this is a 10 year old child trying to fall asleep, but that routine is the thing that alerts you to the fact that you're about to do something of significance, right? Whether it's deep thinking or athletic performance or whatever. So I, I mean, I, I really agree. Like as I read those things, I would say build a routine is, you know, probably the highlight as well. Well, you, you you do see that when you have kids, you go, oh, wow, like if I deviate from the routine, if, like because I, you know, wanted to go th- through this, we blew through the nap or, you know, because our flight got in late, you know, we, we got home at seven instead of five. So we started the routine two hours late or whatever it is. They're a mess. And it's not just that they're tired. It's that I think they're scared. Like the world suddenly feels different because the structure that they're used to is gone. And, and uh, you see this with dogs too. Like if I, if I forget to feed my dog at the time that I normally feed my dog, my dog is like starts acting out. Right. 
and and so so the idea that we're somehow as adults like radically different than children or animals is like probably a bit arrogant like we, we all benefit from structure and order because it 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 it's like you know on a horse they put on those blinders so it doesn't have to think about what's going on over here and over there and then isn't worried about it in a way that's kind of what routine does and i think that's why athletes are so into routine. Mm -hmm. It's it's not just the sort of trance and the ritual of the experience. I think that's a huge part of it. And I could talk about that all day. I think it's that like, there's all these things that are not helpful for them to think about, you know, the crowd, the critics, you know, how much playing time they're going to get, how tired they are, blah, 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 blah. And so they want to, they want the routine to help narrow in their sort of scope of concern so they're really just focusing on what matters yep point well made point well made um okay so that's the if we you know if we think about stillness that is the personal preparation portion of this you know full-on arc um towards uh mastering obstacles right so you know i know the obstacle of the of the way the obstacle is the way was written first, um, it, it, but it's focused on the correct perception of the obstacle, the execution of the action plan and will. Um, I think that you know, now that now that we've kind of got mind, spirit, body, let's talk about the second half of like, all right, how do I assess the challenges and how do I confront sure. the challenges? Um, all right, so um, obstacle. What are the steps yeah. in perceiving your obstacle? Like, how do you do? How do you look at it from enough perspectives that you do it correctly? So the the big insight from the Stoics, uh, I think, is sort of the core of the sort of perception side of things. Comes from Epictetus. He says, uh, "It's not things that upset us; it's our judgment about things." So obviously, this is an insight related to stillness as well. But his his point is that like events are objective and then we have opinions about them so you know somebody said something to you it's not, it's only an insult because you've decided it's an insult right um uh the market goes up and down we decide that it's a re recession or a bull market like we or that it's a good market or a bad market these are decisions that we uh, these are opinions that we are putting on top of objective events. Yeah. And so it's really important that you realize that you have this kind of superpower is that you decide what things mean. So I'm not talking about the law of attraction that like, Hey, if you say it's good, it's good. But it's more that like you have the ability to tell yourself the story that's going to help you react in the way that you want to react. So like the stoic concept is like, we don't control what happens. We control how we respond. And that's going to start by, how we think about it, what we tell ourselves about it, you know, whether we let it rattle us or not, right. and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think, I mean, you're talking essentially about uh, mental anchoring, right? Just don't be mentally anchored yes. to any particular thing. Make sure that you're, you know, viewing this obstacle from different angles and different ways. And your, you know, your ability to approach it kind of in a level headed way is going to be better. Yeah. And look, it, it shouldn't be that controversial to say that like what one person thinks is really bad. Another person thinks is awesome. Right. Uh, right. Uh, another person thinks is fantastic or, you know, like a lot of the problems or obstacles that, you know, you and I might complain about, like there's a good portion of the world that would like do a lot of things to have that problem. Right. And so, you know, just the ability to zoom out and see these things a little bit differently just prevents us. It doesn't magically change them, but it just prevents us from being overwhelmed by them, yeah. can prevent us from being so discouraged by them. And it can allow us to go like, OK, look, I didn't want to get fired like nobody would want to get fired, but I did get let go. And so what am I going to do? Right. What how, what what good can I derive from this experience? You know, it's you go, oh. Look, I was I was I was stuck in this job. I was never going to leave, and now I have to leave. And so I'm going to find what I'm going to do next. Yeah, I mean, and I think in that in that, by the way, I think you just implicitly um, um, kind of instructed about how to break an obstacle down, right, into kind of logical pieces and ordered pieces in order to kind of attack piece by piece. Um, okay, uh, what do what do we need from ourselves? 
to be able to perceive the obstacle correctly. I mean, I think there's some, you know, as a, you know, my, my podcast is called the intangibles podcast, right? So I think there's some intangibles that are required sure. there. Um, how about you? Yeah, what no. do you think? Well, uh, yeah, I think, um, some co- confidence is important, right? Yeah. Like if, if you're like this person that sort of is really tied up in, in how, things appear to be going right. Or what other people are saying, you're going to be much more rattled than someone who's like, uh, no, I got this, you know, like, so, so I think some sort of quiet confidence is an important and tangible as as far as these obstacles go, you know, just a a handle on your emotions. Like I just, I talk and see people where they're just like, you know, one day they're doing amazing and the next day the world's going to end. Like you want to sort of cultivate a kind of, uh, an, a, some semblance of like nerve control. Some, it's not that the stoic has no emotion. It's that the stoic, it attempts not to be at the mercy of their emotions, right? That, that, that they push out the destructive emotions. Yeah. They have objectivity. So that's an important, yes, yes, that's exactly right. They have objectivity. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what I would point out, you know, as we're talking about this, um, I think that the elements that we're discussing um, and the elements of stoicism broadly, they resemble, uh, to me at least, uh, the process of critical thinking. Sure. You yeah. know, when, when, I, mean, yeah, I, I had, a, I had a, a headmaster of a school come on just, and just discuss critical thinking and the, o- the overlap between this and, um, and that, you know, what he had to say without getting into stoicism um, – they, they resemble a lot to me. So and, and that's goodness, right? I mean, I think that's supporting yeah. for the notion of, you know, why this is valuable and why it has worked. Yeah. I mean, what the Stoics really, what the Stoics really believe in is the power of reason and the power of logic to override kind of the opposite of those things. So, you know, what, what one of the things Epictetus says, he's like, look, uh, when an impression hits you, like an opinion, he says, you have to stop and you have to you have to put it up to the test, right? He says, don't just take your first impression, put it up to the test. So when you when you see something and you're scared, you don't just go, I am scared. You go, why is this scaring me? What is it? Is it something worth being scared of? Does being scared make it better? You know, does making does being scared make me more vulnerable? You know, um, and and so just the decision to sort of think critically about your own thoughts is a I think it's a huge advantage. Yeah, I mean, that, that, what you're what you're essentially talking about is uh, irrationality, right? And that irrationality yes. steals your energy. And so, so why? Yeah, you just don't, don't, don't let it happen. Well, it steals your energy, and it often. Uh, there's a quote from Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut. He goes like, "There's no problem so bad that you can't make it worse." <laughs> and and I think that so it's not just like it's exhausting. To, to be irrational, but that often, you know, an irrational person or, or a person at the mercy of some irrational emotions is faced with something, you know, somebody says, Hey, I don't want to work together anymore. And instead of going, okay, well, maybe, maybe you'll change your mind or, you know, thanks for the opportunity, uh, blah, blah, blah. They go like, how dare you? Right. And they try to argue and they fight. And then, and now you took this thing that was mildly uncomfortable and you've turned it into a, a blood feud, you know? Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Or, I mean, let's turn it on its head, right? So if we get to the point where we don't implicitly feel the negative impact of an obstacle, we can actually start to look for the opportunities that are contained within that obstacle, right? So we, we can turn this negative thing into an opportunity. Yes, you need to have the sort of strength and the space uh, and the patience to be able to go, okay, everyone else is seeing the problem this way. But actually, if we stop, we spin it around, we look at it from this angle. Well, again, of course, I would rather this not be happening at all, but it is happening. And it presents me the opportunity to to accomplish X. It, that X might not be uh, as valuable as a goal as the one I was originally setting out for, but it's nevertheless an opportunity. It's like, you, you know, you're set out to do something and, and somebody really messes it up. Okay. Uh, it's, it's irredeemable. It can't be fixed, but is this an opportunity to practice patience? Is this an opportunity to forgive someone? Is this an opportunity to stop and go, why is this person in my life? You know, why do I keep giving them chances to do this to me? And now I'm going to, you know, quietly detangle myself from this, you know, destructive relationship. There's like, 
so many, even even the really bad situations have some you know opportunity for reflection to learn a lesson to just not repeat the same mistake yeah and and, and that i mean that is that's the difference between a kind of mediocre problem solver and a good problem solver is going hey wait i can really pull something from this um w- all right, so you've got it. You've you've looked at this thing. You may have been able to figure out how to make uh, lemonade from lemons. That you, you're gonna you're gonna build the leader, you know, who's confronting an issue is gonna build an action plan, right? Um, when you build an action plan, you know, again back to obstacles the way. What does that option? What does that action plan contain? I think it contains. Uh, so so like the idea in the book is like okay, first how are we gonna look at it? And then the second, what the Stoics are really concerned is, is like, what am I going to do here? Right. Right. Like, yeah. what action am I taking? Um, because, again, you're not just magically going to untie this knot with your mind. What are you going to do? And so I think what the Stoic, you know, obviously perseverance and persistence is a huge part of the sort of Stoic toolkit, you know, not being discouraged, continuing, you know, putting in the hard work. One of, one of the things I think the Stoic Although the Stoic is, is sort of deeply principled and deeply committed to you know doing things the right way, there's also a pragmatism to it. So you know, Marcus Aurelius goes, "Look, if there are thorns in the path, go around." You know, the amount of people that I see that are like, "Well, this is the way I'm supposed to do it, and it's not working, so I'm just going to continue to do it until magically it works." That's not persistence. That's insanity, right? Uh, the, the Stoic, the Stoic says, okay, the normal way isn't going to work, but there's 50 other, I was talking to someone, they had a great analogy. They're like, if I want to go from New York to California, there's like 30 routes you can take, you know, or probably an infinite amount of routes. You can fly, you can drive, you could take a boat, you know, it'd take a long time, but you could take a boat, you know, you could walk, you could take the 10 freeway, or you could take, I I don't, I only know the 10, but you could take a bunch of different free, you know, like there's lots of ways to get there. And I think you want to be, you want to get to a place where you're, you're not so you're, you're, you're comfortable going any of the, any of the ways. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain kind of underlying, um, kind of, I don't know, just maybe it's an understanding that, you know, as, kind of placid on the surface as a stoic seems there is a resilience of vigor uh an energy um that is available to a stoic in terms of a problem in solving a problem right that you know that, that that's, that's, that's not exactly right. readily apparent um and you've and you've got to bring that i mean that's pretty your that's the part of the game you've got to bring to it you've got to just be ready to go hey it's going to be harder than i think it's going to take longer i'm ready to go yeah, yeah. Um, a, a stoic is is certainly not easily discouraged and doesn't demand it happen the easy way. Right. Yeah, I love the you know just reflecting right now. There's a a story about um, uh, a, a large company and a small individual both trying to get their hands on. I think it was a plantation. Maybe it was like a banana plantation or yeah. something like that. And mm-hmm. and and one one the, you know the guy with all the resources they bring an army of lawyers and they're trying to you know sue the you know you know um, oh 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 I remember what it was. There two people said they owned the plot. Right. And so they're yes. trying to disentangle that and figure it all out. The other guy who doesn't have all the resources literally just goes and buys it from both people. So they both they both get paid. Yes. It doesn't really matter who owned it, but now he does. Right. And, you know, in the meantime, you yeah, know, these other guys are just spinning their wheels. Yeah, I think I think it's like, would you rather be right or would you rather solve the problem? Yeah. Right. And and uh, I think that happens. I mean, that happens in relationships. It happens in business negotiations like we we end up like we insist on these sort of these recognitions or the, you know having it go a certain way when really it's like come on just solve just solve the problem you'll both be happier like um and that's something i definitely think about in relationships it's like what is the cost of being right here so it's like you know you you get your way but then your wife is unhappy or you get your way and now your employees resent you or your business partner thinks you're an ass like, did you really win? You know, so uh, it's not about being right. It's about moving forward and, and resolving the issue. Totally. 
Totally. All right. Now, I'm, I'm going to take you in a, in a little bit of the deep water of Obstacles Away, and I know it's been a while okay. since you wrote it, so um, I'm totally willing to um, throw a lifeline, um, or you could just score okay. ma- master points. So this is a question about how you execute on an action plan, and in the book, you kind of give... I don't know. It's not like a list of steps, but almost a list of recommendations. And I think the execution, I mean, that's what we should all really strive for is the execution, right? And so that's one thing that I really wanted to dig in with you. Do you want to answer or do you want want me to give you things to bounce off of? Yeah, I'll answer. Okay, cool. Let's do it. All right. How do you you execute on an action plan? Um, I, I like to start with the smallest part of the action plan. I go like, what's the, wh- where can I, like, to me, I'm a deep believer in momentum. So what's the easiest part of this problem I can solve right now? Right. So like Dave Ramsey talks about this with debt. Um, he, he goes like line up all your debts and then start paying off the little ones. Cause you, you want it, even though financially it might actually make the most sense to pay off the one with the highest interest rate. Um, actually it's the, the momentum is such a, palpable force in our lives that you want to, you want to cross off the easiest things first. Okay. So that, so execution, um, is, uh, break the problem down and knock off the easy things first. Okay. It should work. Yep. Yep. It yep. Work. Um, I liked one, one of the steps I liked was, um, never in a hurry, never worried. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, t- that's totally right. There, like the, the, uh, ability to take the long view, the ability not to be obsessed. Like one of the things I try to remind myself in, in, and this is a good analogy I've, I've gotten as a runner is like, you don't know when other people started, you don't know, uh, when they're ending. So don't compare yourself to other people and feel like you're not making progress or you're not going fast enough. Like we're all doing our own race. And so you don't need to be in a hurry. You just need to be hitting the benchmarks that you set for yourself. Totally. Um, this one we actually just talked about, but I'm just going to repeat it, is the big pragmatic. This is the you know guy that bought the plots of land from both, right? Is just get to the heart of the issue, settle it yep. as fast as you can. Um, I think the other really significant one, which I'm sure you probably have a thought on, is just finish, right? You, I mean, the, you know, sure. it's, it's lovely to have a process to execute on, but it's even better to finish. It's better to get it done. Yeah, that's right. Like, look, eventually you got to ship, right? And there's a, a great line from Churchill. He said, you know, another way to spell um, perfection is paralysis. Um, and and I, the amount of people that I see that they can get 80 percent of the way there and then they spend, you know, twice as much time on the final 20 percent. And they and they they're not making progress because they've uh, one, they're lacking a little bit of that pragmatism we're talking about. But mostly what they're lacking is the ability to close. And ultimately, you got to close. And that, and again, that's kind of the idea of like solving the easy ones first. It's like let's let's create a, a system or a feeling that we are crossing things off the list here. Yeah, um, I think in your book you say specifically the world doesn't care that there is a plan. The only thing that gets credit is execution. Yeah, that's totally right. Uh, there's also an Eisenhower quote I think that's related to planning that I like, where he goes. You know, the planning it, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. So, of course, you make the plan. But at the end of the day, you you got to get down and dirty with reality and reality doesn't care that much for your plans. Yeah. Um, so kind of tangential to that. I'm, um, how do you see uh, the attributes or the intangible in this case, uh, will as in willpower? Yeah. So so the, the Stoics have an interesting uh sort of more expansive definition of will. It's not just like willpower because a lot of a lot of it's about acceptance, right? I think so many people, they think will is like, I will not be stopped. You will not deter me. But one of the, one of the things the Stokes are really concerned about is like, is this a problem that can be solved with willpower? You know, death is not a problem that can be solved with willpower. What other people do and say and think is not a problem that can be solved with willpower, right? Like, Think, things break and sometimes they can't be put together. So part part of back together. So part of what the Stoics really want to cultivate is is like the ability to endure, the ability to accept, the ability to move on. And so the, one of I think at the real core of Stoicism is this idea of a more fati. And I actually carry an more fati sort of coin in my pocket as, as a reminder. Marcus really says like, look, what you throw in front of a fire is fuel for the fire. You know, the, it, 
what Amor Fati translates to is a love of fate. Like, hey, I am not going to fight and kick and scream against everything I don't want. I'm going to say, okay, this is great. I'm going to like, not just like, all right, I'll deal with it. But like, this is great. We're going to make, we're going to, we're going to crush this. You know, we're going to, we're going to make this awesome together, even if it's not where we saw ourselves or even necessarily where we would like to be. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that about it. We, we don't actually get to choose what happens, but we get to choose how we feel about it. Right. So why, why wouldn't yeah. we choose to feel good about it? Like, why wouldn't we? Of course we, we should. Sometimes we don't, yeah, but right. we should. It's not easy to do. It's easy to be flip about it. So I'm trying not to do that. But it, it's just the idea is like I, I'm going to decide to feel good because um, anything else is a punishment to myself. I, yeah, agreed. Um, all right. So I'm going to start to wrap it up here. Um, OK, because I know that the time is limited. I, you know um, I, what I do want to tell people and maybe I'll give you the last word on it in general is um, what we just did really high level overview, right? I mean, a, a proper conversation, if we dug into these things, probably would have lasted three times as long, if not longer. Sure. I mean, I think it's a conversation you have with yourself over a lifetime, right? Like, like the, when you think about what, what I, what I try to constantly remind myself about someone like Marcus Aurelius, whose books meditation, whose book meditation has been so influential in my life. This is a book he wrote over a number of years and that it was an active practice that he was sitting down and the reason he repeats himself is not because he forgot. It's that it's really hard to internalize these things and 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 that they can be dissected and digested so many different ways. And, and that so you've got to think of philosophy is not like something you learn one time. It's something you practice and you explore and you you uh, sort of develop, you cultivate inside yourself over a lifetime. Yeah. I mean, I, so I, I mean, the way I view it is there's some books that are underlying books and some books that are not. And the underlying books are the books that, you know, kind of get well-worn in, they get read a lot of times, they get referred to, you know, and that you like pull out certain things to remind yourself again and again and again. And I will tell you that, you know, my recommendation to the people listening is that these are underlying books. So you should get hard copies, uh, even if you do get an audible or whatever, get a hard copy, read them and annotate them because yeah, I think they are, they're just chocked full of, mm, you know, not only stories, but, but process, um, in terms of how do you actually do things? And I, you know, uh, I read the intro earlier. That's why, you know, professional athletes and politicians and other people kind of swear by these things. So, um, you know, I've got one more question or kind of one more just high general thing, but right. la your last word on kind of this, uh, set of, you know, this companion, this, this, these two books as companion pieces. Oh, well, yeah. And look, I would just say, thank, thank you. I mean, I, I think the highest praise you can, you can give an author is, is to actually interact with the material to like sort of write it down, write it. When I see a book and it's all marked up, I don't think like, Oh, they desecrated the book. I think, Oh wow, this, thank you. You know? So I, I I wrote when I wrote Obstacle is the way I, I you know, I thought that was I, I thought I was just writing about obstacles. And then, you know, I, I wrote the sequel, which is Ego is the Enemy. And then uh, Stillness is the Key. I started a few years later. Uh, the the idea w was was just exploring what stoicism, what what ancient wisdom can offer us here in modern life. And the truth is, we're not that different than people who lived 2000 years ago. A lot of the technology has changed. But fundamentally, the people haven't changed. And so I think there's a lot of value in looking backwards, looking to some of the wisest people who've ever lived and and seeing what insights we could apply from their lives to ours. Uh, there's a quote I have in the ego book from Bismarck where he says, any fool can learn by experience. I prefer to learn by the experiences of others. And that's sort of the, the attitude that I try to bring to my reading and my writing. So and I will I will. Um, grant you that I thought to myself, you know, there's a good portion of this knowledge that, it, you know, is out there, but it probably would take, you know, a very, very long time to read what is all centralized in, in kind of these two pieces. So, all right. So before we, yeah, can, they're, they're entry points. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And go just take a look at the references to find out, you know, how to dig deeper, I guess. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, for the people listening, uh, I assume the best way to stay connected is by joining your email list. 
Yeah. So if you're interested in this sort of stoic mindset of solving your problems and, and applying the ancient wisdom to modern life, I, I think the best part is probably uh, dailystoic.com. I do a, a free daily email of a stoic practice each morning. Um, it, and, I, you know, it's got about 200,000 people all over the world that are sort of in the same boat trying to just get a little bit better, solve their problems, manage their emotions. And so, uh, you know, you can follow me at Ryan Holiday everywhere, but but Daily Stoic is also a great place to start as well. Yeah, so so online, www.dailystoic.com, and then there's the email list that you'll mm-hmm. see the button right there. Groovy. Okay, Ryan, l- I mean, let's end up the discussion here. You know, I know it was okay. a long time in the making for us to get together and have this chat, and I had really been looking forward to it, and it absolutely lived up to my expectations. Uh, expectations. Uh, it's been really helpful for me. So um, thank you very much for coming on. No, thanks for the opportunity. And and uh, yeah, you're right. I think we could have talked for, for three or four hours. Uh, but uh, I, I think ultimately, these are the kinds that people just spend so much time watching the news or gossiping or, you know, wasting time on Netflix. And, and meanwhile, there's this wisdom out there. And, and there are these sort of lifelong benefits that come from sort of adding some of the intangibles that you're talking about to their lives. And, and so I just urge people to, to sort of continue that search. Uh, I think it pays, pays not just short-term dividends, but very long-term ones. Perfect way to end. Thanks so much. This has been Intangibles. You can find this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, and many other podcast platforms. You can also find it at its home on the web, which is www.intangiblespodcast.com. I'm Steve Berg. Thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode.